Hello everybody, my name is Sati Gossett. Welcome to another episode of Pan and Zoom, where filmmakers talk about the craft of filmmaking. Today we're here with the wonderful character actor, Mark Ralston, and I guarantee you, you've seen him in something. Hello Mark, how are you? Hey Sati, thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. So, I mean, you are in the category of that guy when it comes to films, movies, and video games. And what we always like to ask is, how did you get your beginnings? Where did you start? What was the, when the acting bug hit you? Yeah, I don't think it was so much the acting bug, but my father was a single parent, three children. He kind of announced to all of us that, you know, Saturdays was the day he had to pay the bills and clean the house, so we all had to choose something. So my brother chose to play the guitar, my sister decided to dance ballet, and my father had taken us to the theater, mm -hmm. uh, the arena stage in Washington, D.C. was nearby. The Washington Theater Club was a great fringe theater company. And uh, found out that Washington Theater Club had a Saturday morning into afternoon children's workshop. So at the age of nine, I would take a bus all the way from Bethesda, Maryland, all the way into downtown D.C., just near DuPont Circle, and go to the Washington Theater Club. And then it was then that, you know, all actors get a response, and people were like, hey, you're funny, you're good, and, and uh, continued on there for a while. I was actually asked to turn professional when I was a child uh, with the arena stage, but my father nixed that. He, was, he said, no, 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 you, I'm not going to have you do that. You need to finish your education, and then if you want to decide to be an actor, you can be an actor. Awesome. Did you, did you do it in college? Did you study theater arts in college? Well, that was the thing. It was like a, an elective in high school. I participated in a, a production of Twelfth Night. Oh, wow. And then got to college, and in fact, I heard your other guest, Nikki, talk about how uh, she wanted to get an easy A. <laughs> <laughs> so the same thing for me. It was like, oh, Theater 101, easy A, I'll do that, because I was actually a philosophy major. And that's when I got bit, because uh, to you just have to do the requisite things for the course. You know, you either had to build the sets or, you know, act in the thing or support somehow. And uh, I auditioned and got the lead in Bus Stop, William Inge's Bus Stop, and I played Bo Decker. And that was it. And that's all she wrote. Did you, like, go to New York, kind of chase your dreams, or what did you do after no, that? No, it was really interesting. The uh, head professor there, uh, um, Dr. Press, um, was a real Stanislavski okay. uh, aficionado, so he'd started me off in method acting. Um, but one day, walking through the student union building, I saw a little placard that said, study abroad, and I thought, wow, that could be kind of cool for my junior year. Sent off the little sheet of paper and got a pr prospectus back that said that I could study at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. So I was like, down, I'm down, I'm gonna go to London, this is the place to study. I get there. And none of that was true. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what happened? It was just a complete ruse. I mean, they 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 had written something in the prospectus, uh, really poorly uh, worded, and had me believing that I would in fact be able to, and there was no chance. But as serendipity would have it, the woman who was running the program, her husband uh, Anton Rogers, was a fairly prominent television and stage actor, and he had come in to direct us some check off one acts. And at which point, again, some recognition from somebody else, and he s said, what are you going to do when you finish this year abroad? I thought I'd just go back to uh, America and finish out my degree. And he went, no, 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 you're, you're not going to do that. He said, you're a real actor. You're going to stay in England, and you're going to get trained properly. Wow. So he coached me through my auditions. I got into every school except for the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Ironic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I went to uh, a place called the Drama Center, which is famous for like Colin Firth, Michael Fassbender, Tom Hardy, and me, and amongst others. What uh, technical aspects did you learn and in, in from I guess the Brits? Or yeah. yeah. Well, our, our, our particular school was very, very uh, unique because we were the only sort of method-based school in all of England. So we had a, a teacher called Dorian Cannon, who was a protege of, um, um, oh, I'm blanking. Um, it'll come to me. Uh, <laughs> um, but she was a strict method teacher from New York City. But then we also had uh, John Blatchley, who was a director of the RSC and the English National Opera. So he was really teaching as the 
sort of a, a real British classical style. But then we had his wife who taught us uh, mime and more of the European, like French influence. So it was a really well-rounded uh, training, but the essence of the training was something called, um, uh, well, it was actually developed by uh, uh, one of our teachers, Jat Malmgren, who had been a dancer and was a soloist, but he eventually hooked up with a guy called Scott Carpenter, who was a philosopher and uh, Jungian, and they developed this movement psychology. So it's based in Jungian psychology, but it's all about archetypes. Mm -hmm. So, but it's very, very precise, and the whole essence of the training was that we would be, if we made it to the final year, because back when I went to drama school, there was a cut. So it was like Survivor. Oh, totally. <laughs> no, really, for real. You know, 60 of us started and 16 finished. Yeah. And when you get, got to the performance year, not only did you get to perform, but you had to do these things uh, with the movement psychology. You had to create and write six different characters. Wow. So there's some, some elements of improv. Uh, yeah, but it, this was actually scripted. Okay. Yeah. But uh, to get there, and if you could do all six archetypes, that was pretty wild and crazy. I only managed four. Because Yat, our teacher, was very, very precise in uh, uh, saying who could actually perform a certain piece if they achieved the archetype, t uh, archetype completely. So was it for a panel of judges? That, or just no, just, uh, no, the actual performance was for the public, but to, to get to the performance, Yat was the... He had to endorse you, Yeah, the basically. final arbiter. So were there like talent scouts in the audience for the final... Yeah, the final performances, performance, yeah. Or? Yeah, directors of theaters from all over England. Um, yeah, it was a real springboard. And quite a few of the people that I was in school with ended up going to you know, the Glasgow Repertory Theater Company and other theater companies around England. Uh, I was lucky enough to sort of segue directly into film. Yeah. So what would you consider your kind of big break? as far as film or TV, because I know... Well my, well, my biggest break was Aliens. Yes. But getting to Aliens, just a little brief segue, was I'd done a movie uh, with Al Pacino called Revolution, directed by Hugh Hudson. Okay. And um, when I was interviewed for Aliens, Gail Ann Hurd, James Cameron's then wife, uh, asked the proverbial question, so what have you been doing? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, I just finished this movie with Al Pacino. And I don't know what possessed me, but I went into a, the longest yarn <laughs> of my life, and I made it sound as though I had the next best role to Al Pacino, <laughs> and, uh, and it worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, two, two weeks later, I was meeting Jim, and we were reading, and then three weeks after that, I got hauled into Pinewood uh, Studios where Cameron had his office, and they finally handed me the script and said, we want you to be Drake, and with one caveat is that you have to bulk up and well how much weight did you have to gain I ended up gaining 45 pounds of muscle muscle I oh. was ripped I, I but I trained for like four months morning they send a driver for me I'd go there just pumping all day they had this uh, northern England uh, uh, he was actually a farmer but he he was actually the muscle behind the power loader yeah. Wow. Yeah, like a little bit of kabuki theater. He was all dressed in black, but he was moving Sigourney around in the power loader. Oh, wow. And he had me, at one point, I was lifting 80-pound dumbbells fly, doing flies in each hand. So I was, I was ripped. I, I, I got big. But, I, but as an actor, I, I didn't want to be Arnold or Vin Diesel. I just, so, I, I, so I pretty much let it go. I mean, I still stay in shape, but... I just, I, I thought it'd be limiting, you know, because I really am a character actor. Never had any illusion that I was uh, um, Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise. I always, I pride myself on transformation, which is what they taught us at Drama Center. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the essence of what a character actor is. And working with people like Pacino, who is obviously a quote unquote star, um, what do you see as the difference between what you do versus what he does? Um, or did you glean anything from someone like him? Because you work with some, I guess, big, big movie stars. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it is a collaborative process working on set with other actors. So do you glean anything off of other actors as far as what they do technique-wise? Or it's like, oh, that's yeah, cool, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. And well, the, the, the only time ever I've really, like, 
glean something from somebody and, and have used it is uh, chatting with Morgan Freeman on the set of Shawshank and literally just said, you know, my first question was, was, hey, when is it that the powers that be get you and what you do? And he told me his whole life story, which is fascinating. Yeah, because didn't his big break happen in like 52 or something like that? When, well, well, I know he did Street later. Smart. Have you seen Street oh, Smart? God, yeah. Oh, my God. Like, oh, God, yeah. Well, he, but you know, you know the story about that. He was driving a cab in New York City, couldn't get arrested after an electric company, mm -hmm. had a fare that took him directly outside the, the building where his reading was supposed to be. And he had the script with him, and he thought, ah, man, I haven't worked on this, but ah, screw it. I'm going to cold read it. Right. So he cold read for that. Wow. And remembering that role, I mean, that he was, was one he of was the scariest roles. He was terrifying. Oh, my God. Like the, the, the scissors to the eyeball, that was... <laughs> but, yeah. but then the other thing Morgan gave me that I use to this day is he said, he said, it's all about talking. It's just hang in the frame and talk. And that's really been the essence of, of what I try to do. Um, and I achieved it best early on in my career, so it's something that I can roll into now. But um, when I did my audition for Shawshank, it was like I came out, I didn't know if I'd get it or not, and that's another story in itself. But... I remember leaving going, I did it. I found it. Yeah, there, there's something freeing in that when I don't want to say you don't care, but you, you don't care about the results. And you just kind of go in and do what you do. And I, I saw a video about with Brian Cranston saying, you know, your job is not the role. Your job is the audition. Mm -hmm. You know, and you go in and do the audition the best you can, and then you leave it alone. And, you know, and that means being present mm -hmm. instead of being so hung up on the, the outcome. Totally, yeah. And, you know, when he says talking, it's just like, don't worry about if the scene is good or not. You just do the scene. Live the scene. Yeah. Very much. And that, and that seems to be something that you do because I don't want to say you're invisible, but you're also kind of omnipresent in every role that you're in, mm. at least the roles that I've seen, from Boggs to your character in The Departed or Star Trek or whatever, you just kind of like, and that's kind of the essence of that guy. Like familiar, yeah. but not unfamiliar. Yeah, I try and, I mean, I, I lose myself in, in roles, and certainly when you're present in the scene, I mean, you, 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 you have to be thinking, but you have to be thinking like the character. Mm -hmm. um, but I love, I love transforming to the point where people don't even know it's you. I mean, I, I played um, an admiral in the, the film Midway. Mm -hmm. And a buddy of mine, who's a former Marine, he, he called me afterward and he was like, I don't believe it. I was watching that movie and I didn't even know it was you. <laughs> Till afterward, it was, I saw the credits and it was like, oh, Jesus. You know, so it's, uh, it's great fun. It's funny how your friends get mad at you because you didn't tell them they were in the role. They say, how come you didn't tell me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so as far as, you know, working with actors, also what's it like working with, directors, you know, and, and their demands, you know, from obviously Jim Cameron's the big one to Scorsese. Like, what do they demand of you or not demand of you as an as a actor? Well, I'd say the most exacting is probably Jim. Uh, he, he's an absolute genius. Uh, I, I will say, though, I don't think he's necessarily uh, an actor's director. I mean, he, he, he's, he, he's a visionary. He's a technician. Uh, he knows what he wants. So he would certainly, if you were doing something he didn't like, he'd tell you. But he kind of let me go free in that. And um, uh, whereas, say, Scorsese, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's in and around all the time and very, very creative. Like, uh, I don't know if we were doing this scene outside the restaurant, me and David O'Hara. You know, Was that the one? Is a, he's a oh, cop. he's a cop. He's, yeah, he's got it's a fantastic thing. So we'd, we'd worked the scene, and then and Marty was enjoying it. And he came out, and he was like, OK, OK, guys, let me do this. <laughs> Do me a take, just cuss like crazy. Just, just, just say anything you want, anything you want. Just cuss, because he loves people who cuss. Yeah, or I, characters I, I, I kind of, I kind of picked up on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and O'Hara and I, man, we got on a roll and we got blue, and to the point where Scorsese came out of the video village and he was like, "All right, cut it, stop it. You're killing me. You're killing me. Stop." <laughs> we had such, a, such a good time. I would love to see that those outtakes. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. But it's, but it's nice, you know, whereas Cameron sees you kind of almost like a cog in the machine, you know, where 
Scorsese, and I've heard it from other people that he's kind of the ultimate collaborator. Like he invites ideas. You know, oh, yeah. anyone can kind of pitch in their two cents. Yeah. Because you know, as, as a director, and different directors have different styles, obviously. Um, as far as your career path has gone, um, has there been any? I don't want to say signature moments, but moments where like, do you feel like Aliens was the moment where you kind of quote unquote made it or was there another role? Oh, uh, no, Aliens fit into place in, in my journey in terms of, I always knew in the back of my head if I was gonna get to Hollywood, I'd have to do it on the heels of a hit movie. Mm -hmm. Now I still didn't know Aliens was gonna be a hit movie. I knew it was a big movie, but it was only at the behest of uh, Bill Paxton who harassed me to say he harassed me. How so? Oh man, he called me every week. Every single week, Mark, dude, you gotta come. It's gonna be huge, man. You can't miss it. And I, I said, Bill, yeah, but my kid's little and I don't know, I'm working. And, and he was like, no, man. And then he finally got me and said, I'll give you my apartment. You can stay in my apartment. And so I was like, all right, okay. I made booked the tickets and I never went back to England. Wow. I, five days after going to the premiere of Aliens, I'm starting a movie with Lance Henriksen. <laughs> Uh, a movie called Survival Quest. It's it, it, what a great cast: uh, Catherine Keener, Dermot Mulroney, Paul wow. Provenza. Uh, so it's part of the serendipitous aspect of anybody's life and career. It's like stuff shows up, and you have to be open enough to recognize it and walk through the door and do your thing. Mm -hmm. And you've been able to parlay it not only to movies but TV, but also voiceover work. Mm -hmm. How is um, acting uh, different? like with your voice versus TV. I mean, TV and film is kind of the same, but what the voice work, because you've built up some wonderful credits in yeah. voice work as well. Yeah, I mean, I, my first professional job, they'd been scanning the uh, acting schools in London to find an American youth. Mm -hmm. And I got the job revoicing Jackie Chan in Drunken Monkey and Drunken Master. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was trained by a man who was like this sort of preeminent dubbing director probably in the world, Louis Elman. And uh, I'm, a, I'm an expert dubber. I, I do it, in fact, I was just doing a show this past week. I, I, I love it. It's, it's more freeing because it isn't about this, you know. And I I've always been a mimic, so I love doing voices. But uh, as far as work, oh God, I, it just, it's the best. I just, I love voice work. Because it's only a couple hours in the studio and then you have the rest of your day and, you know, and residuals and all that fun stuff. It's, it's the gravy train. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, speaking of gravy train, <laughs> um, you know, certain actors, they get significant roles and then they get to do things like um, autograph conventions. What's been, What's that been like, you know, with interacting with fans, going to autograph conventions like Comic Con and wherever? What is that like? You know, it's the people that attend cons are a certain type of people. Yes. And um, but I've always just sat back and recognized that if it wasn't for these people, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And uh, it can be a lot of fun. The biggest thing is is that mainly I do shows with the cast of Aliens. Mm -hmm. And that's the only movie in my whole career where we're actually genuinely friends and we actually hang out and see each other. And so for me to go off to do a con with, you know, Michael Bean and Jeanette Goldstein and Bill Hope, it's just... Um, it's like a reunion. It is, and it's a lot of fun. Like, we, what, we always got together well. Uh, and it's really the only movie in my entire career that that's, that's true. I mean, I, I love all the guys in Shawshank. Shawshank was probably the best experience in terms of being on, on a film because we rehearsed, we were in this one street, one town center town in the Midwest and it was all about the movie and we knew it was a great script but oh my gosh, we just, uh, you know, the, the, the amazing prison that mm -hmm. we shot in. Now, was that prison, where was it shot? Mansfield, Ohio. Ohio, not Maine. No, no, okay. no, not Maine. <laughs> And I remember we were talking about, I guess, the expression of the characters in Shawshank and how, I don't want to say the main character actor, but, you know, he had some, he, he took a little upbringing to how the character was expressed towards him. 
and mean and meaning the relationship between Boggs and Dufresne. Right. You know, how important is it for you to stick to the script versus liberties taken as far as the expression of the character? Um, I, or does it depend on the director? It depends on the director. Mm -hmm. um, the words in Shawshank were so well done that um, there wasn't a lot of improv going on. Whereas in Aliens, uh, Bill Paxton tried to improvise every single day. It, it, it felt like it. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then Jim would come in and go, all right, Bill, don't say that. <laughs> say the other thing, but don't say that. You know, he was constantly having to monitor Bill. But that's just Bill's enthusiasm, you know, and love for filmmaking. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, even Scors Scorsese was like, you know, if you had a really good reason to offer something up, but basically he he wanted it as written. In fact, we went through a whole huge thing where uh, Jack Nicholson was who fancies himself a writer. Mm -hmm. um, he was rewriting The Departed. Throughout the shoot, you know, this this is an interesting anecdote. Uh, I kept getting pages where my death scene, which was really like a page and a half, was dwindled down to like a paragraph of this. And I'd come onto the set, and Jack would be like, "Hey, did you like what I did for you? You like you <laughs> like that change in the scene?" And I'd just go, "No, what's all this about?" <laughs> so I finally cornered Bill Monahan. I said, "Bill, the writer, I said, what the hell's going on, man? Yeah, the whole the whole the scene's been decimated." He's like, that's yeah, Jack. And, he, and Bill, Bill was pissed off about it. But he said, look, the whole deal is if, if, we, if we don't mollify him, we're, they're afraid he's going to walk the set. I was like, oh, gosh. So I was going back and forth, L.A. to, to Boston and New York, and I'm coming back at the very end of the shoot to shoot the death scene, which is the, the meat of my character. And I got in the hotel, and soon after, envelope slid under the door that said, in black marker, this is the scene, as per Marty, triple underlined, and the scene had been restored. And then I finally learned uh, that you know uh, Marty wasn't a big fan of Jacks because he was he was he was being Jack. Yeah, yeah. And, um, Stepping what, on some toes. It, yeah, it happens. Yeah. And from what I understand, the, your scene was kind of they deleted a, a large part of your scene, I think, because it's a deleted scene where you talk about. You're dying, and then no, it's there. There, yeah. no, no. Because they say deleted scene, and then there's a part where you're talking about. Because it turns out that you're an undercover cop too, correct? Well, no, that 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 was a manipulation. Okay. Yeah. What happened was was yeah, there was no deleted scene. Um, um, gosh, we better not be. I mean, we shot like it was. That was the moment of my life. We shot mm. ten thousand feet of film. Wow. In a day, and Joe Reedy. Uh, Marty's first said, hey, let's listen, Marty's loving everything. He just wants to know, do you have anything else you want to do? And I'm thinking, wait a second, man, we just shot 10,000 feet of film. It's like, I would be a real jerk to say, oh, yes, give me another take and then not do anything with it. So I said, is Marty happy? He goes, he's really happy. I said, I'm happy too. There you go. So we just, we ended that one. But um, leave me back in there. Um, um, no, I forgot where I was going to go with that. No, I mean, I guess I got fooled because I, because you would see like on on YouTube, it's like this is a deleted scene. It's like, oh, let me ask him about the deleted scene. Yeah. So this is it. So what happened was was throughout the shoot, Marty kept saying to me, he said, he said, Mark, cop, not a cop. I was like, not a cop, no way. You know, we're we're, we're neighborhood, we're we're mm -hmm. in the gang. But you know, Marty edited that movie for a year, really a year. And the biggest manipulation was was when he decided he was going to put up that uh, newscast blurb with my picture, saying I was a cop. Wow! But it, I wasn't really. He was using that as a ruse to win over Costello and loosen up Costello's sense of protection. Because he was he was on uh, DiCaprio's sense. Kind of. Yeah. 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 So. No, it's a fun movie. I mean. It's, yeah. It's an incredible movie. Incredible movie. Yeah. I remember sitting, the first time I read it, I was sitting in the living room with my wife, and I, when I got to my death scene, and then each subsequent page, it was like somebody's dying every page, and I kept saying, oh my God. And she was like, what are you oh my Godding about? I said, this is crazy. Yeah, somebody dies every single page, and they kill the hero. What the heck? It was, it was something. Yeah. Um, so what's next for you that you're allowed to talk about? Right. <laughs> well... Uh, I'm, I'm sort of segue into a lot of uh, the gaming world. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I imagine I can talk about it, but I'm, I'm in the Spider-Man franchise. I played Norman Osborn. I love the gaming world. It's like doing theater in the round, you know, because there's so many cameras all, all around yeah, you. Because they got all the, did they put the, the, the yeah, markers the on gear. your face and yeah. the, the scan and everything? And yeah. But soon that'll all go away. That won't even be anymore. Well, you think it'll just be all kind of AI generated? Yeah. Well, not necessarily AI generated, but even the cameras they have, they've got like 4K, 4D cameras that uh, won't even require you to have the dots for the computer reference. Um, so I really enjoy that work. Um, Luckily, in the midst of the strike, you know, there's a waiver so I can actually shoot a little movie. So I'm shooting a movie with uh, the cast and crew of Bosch, which I am still recurring on, even though last season they went out into the streets. So my character is relegated to the station. So, but Titus Welber said I'll be back on that for the third season. So it's great. I mean, I, I float. I, I do numerous different things. <laughs> No, you got to have a lot of irons in the fire, and, and you know you're fortunate that you've been able to hop from space to space and yeah. you know build this great career. Um, one thing I like to ask is if anyone's starting out, like how, what kind of advice or wisdom would you impart to someone trying to make it in the biz mm. per se? Number one, I would say is is don't quit. <laughs> okay. Because you you quit in this business, they don't care. Nobody cares. Yeah, they got 10 people behind you. Exactly. Yeah. But, I, but I would also say, uh, given where we are at this moment in the industry, is that uh, get really acquainted with all the technology because it, I, I can see um, the technology is going to start to rule the way in which films get made and produced. And, um, you know, in the midst of the strike, I, I personally think that, you know, A, it's going to be a long, hard slog, but I also think that there's going to be a quantum shift in production. Uh, I, it hurts my heart because I'm a movie guy. I love independent film. And I don't know, I just see corporations having taken over the major studios and networks is that, that they're just going to, we're going to be seeing a whole lot of DC and Marvel and Mattel. We're going to see a lot of Mattel. Right. With the success of Barbie. You watch. Yeah, Barbie. There's going to be a Ken movie. A Ken spinoff. There will be. A Ken spinoff. I'll, I'll bet a million dollars on it. It's like, I, I should, I never had any Barbie dolls, but I probably should have kept one if I'd known. Yeah, right. It's going to be the, the successful. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, I think we're about to wrap things up. All right. You know, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Um, you know, been a fan of your movies for a long time. And we look forward to what you have coming up next. Yeah. You know, and you know, regardless of how the technology changes, I'm pretty sure you're gonna have your foot in something. As long as I'm walking and talking, I'll be cool. <laughs> All right, I'd like to thank my guest, Mark Ralston. It's been a wonderful time, just great stories. My name is Sati Gossett. This is Pan and Zoom. Come back for another episode. Keep on filming.